My name is Orrin Martin. I work up at the UCSC Farm and Garden, and I grow stuff and teach stuff about growing stuff. <laughs> uh, I also have done over the decades uh, what we might call soft extension services to various farms and orchards in the area. Oh, this is one such farm. <laughs> Uh, kind of, uh, I'll let these folks talk about the idea, the genesis, and the evolution of this farm and its orchard in, in a minute here. But uh, here, uh, Pie Ranch down the road, uh, uh, Rancho Soquel, uh, Everett Family Farm, and others. I've just been involved, you know, in a very nice reciprocal manner with the various farmers orchards like that. And, and they say uh, my services can be helpful, but I find it's almost the other way around. I find I learn a lot from them and their orchards. Uh, I'm Teresa and Cortec, and I'm one of the three owners of Fifth Crow Farm. And I'm John Vars. I'm a second of the three owners, and um, we feel very fortunate to be able to host Oren here. I think he, he said he grew stuff. Um, He's actually been growing stuff for w over 40 years and had on 50, over actually. <laughs> going on 50 and experience with uh, more than 100 different apple varieties, I would imagine. So, Something like um, that. And many of uh, the apples that we grow here uh, come uh, originally from Oren's Garden at the UCSC Farming Garden. Uh, where we grafted many of those varieties. So I think maybe the entitlement today might be something along the line of putting together some of the major factors or the pieces of the orchard jigsaw puzzle. And so it's about planning and planting. And I got a little piece I'm going to read here in a minute, or actually seconds. Uh, and then, then I would like, if they would, Teresa and John, to just, again, kind of track the idea, the origins and the evolution, the sinuous path to the present day of their orchard. Um, and that is adding it on to an already bumping, robust, complex vegetable and flower, a cut flower operation. So um, let me say this. And then I just want to tick through, you know, Sun, site, soil, orchard layout, irrigation, the kind of basic pieces of the jigsaw puzzle. So I'll read a little here, uh, scribbled as well, having a cup of dark French roast this morning. Uh, <clears throat> planting a, a fruit tree is or should be a considered act. Plan before you plant. And I can't, I'll go off script a little bit here and just say, I can't emphasize that enough. The tendency with people, I'm guilty too, is come bare root planting a season, Jan, Feb, grab a spade, grab a tree, dig a hole, plant the tree. I'm gonna quote the great soul singer Marvin Gaye from one of his early songs in the 60s. Don't you do it, don't you do it, don't you break my heart. And I might add uh, the band, named The Band, which kind of coined the term Americana music, uh, uh, does a rockin' cover of it. You can check it out on YouTube. <laughs> so don't you do it, don't you do it, don't you break my heart. I, I just find a lot of mistakes with trees, whether it's, in, in a sense, it doesn't matter, one, ten, a hundred, a thousand trees. The principles are about the same. You know, obviously your scale dictates methods and materials and machinery or not uh, like that. But I just find a lot of mistakes are made that are not easy to reverse engineer your way out of because of poor or no planning. So planning and planting a small orchard block. All right, continue. now that I've given you that admonition, uh, planting an orchard, a small orchard block is both a long-term commitment and a long-term investment, both literally and figuratively. Uh, but the return is not immediate. Uh, it often takes three to five years before there is a harvest and longer for the trees to quote unquote hit their stride in terms of bearing a full crop. And, and especially even as we stand here today in this year with our having just experienced an incredible whipsaw weather set of patterns from December to, well, you know, this morning, uh, back and forth. Um, um, 
But the return is not uh, immediate. It often takes three to five years before there is a harvest and longer for the trees to hit their stride in terms of bearing a full crop. And it should be noted that not every year sees a bountiful harvest. For instance, <clears throat> this year versus last year. This is one of the skinniest years, I'm gonna say, for fruits. Uh, at the UCSC Farm and Garden we have, oh, I don't know, 13 plums. <laughs> Six peaches, and I think there was a pluot. <laughs> uh, the stone fruits bloom earlier in the season than the palm fruits, palms being apples and pears. And well, we just got a lot, you know, we got rain through the bloom period and even into the apple and pear uh, 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 bloom period. Uh, uh, apples are okay, pears bump it a little better in terms of set, uh, but that's compared to last year, which never happens but did actually happen in 2004, um, which is, uh, it was the best year in terms of yield across the board with all fruits. On the coast, we get a good apricot crop, one in five years, we got a bumper crop. This year, we got a fruit. Uh, so it, it, that's just something to be aware of. Uh, and uh, the success of any given year is largely about weather conditions during the short two, three weeks of bloom in the spring. And that's something to uh, keep in mind when you're picking your orchard site and microclimate. Microclimate makes a difference um, uh, and a considerable one in terms of a boost. Uh, uh, so the question would be, does your microclimate support good pollination? Uh, conditions in the spring and what are those conditions basically need during the bloom period two three weeks where temperatures are above 60 degrees consistently the wind is down now some spots are windier than others your spot windy yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, wind is the operative particularly in the afternoon with westerlies coming in on the coast here so uh, conditions that uh, facilitate bloom greater than 60 degrees minimum wind little or no rain during the bloom period frost free and again that goes to site selection and having a site that is minimal in terms of frost and we'll get to that in terms of lay of the land in a minute here uh, and then uh, do you have pollinators uh, winged insects, principally bees, but not exclusively, are the agents of pollination. Uh, sounds James Bondage or something, uh, I don't know. Uh, or Mission Impossible, I don't know. Uh, uh, and that includes the Apis mellifera, the European honeybee cultivated, and, uh, oh look, there's some hives there. Uh, and you get honey, or somebody gets, the beekeeper gets honey. Uh, uh, there's a couple, three routes to go, but you could raise your own bees and keep them fascinating. And uh, not easy these days, but you get the dividend of honey, or you can just farm it out. And usually you can get a beekeeper to bring their hives in. What are you guys? A friend, yeah. Friend. That's what friends are for, bees, uh, like that. So, um, okay. Um, So what are the conditions during the spring and that so much dictates uh, fruit set or not and also incidence of disease. Uh, uh, full disclosure, these trees are now evidencing more the app way more the apples than the pears. Uh, quite a bit of leaf scab and a little bit of mildew, the two principal diseases of apples. The pears behind us here, or you, uh, not so much. And, the reason is because if you look at the foliage of the pear, it's much waxier and more glossy, and the skin of the pear is also tighter. It's just not as susceptible a, a, a medium for uh, fungal uh, stuff. And Jim and I were up here about a month ago. We did a great video, and everything was just, uh, I, I was going to say something like, this orchard is as the river rafters and the mountain climbers and the road bike riders say beyond category and then I pull in this morning it's like oh geez <laughs> and it's just <laughs> it's just about the persistent fog moisture on foliage will induce disease and then what was your spray program this year John not a, non-existent non-existent so uh We've had years over the last decade and quite a number of years back to back to back where I didn't spray, we didn't need to spray, we had very dry conditions, warm and dry conditions. This winter was not, not one. Um, so uh, 
Even with sprays in an organic system, you would expect a higher incidence of disease with, you know, weather just dictates so much uh, like that. Um, so that's kind of where it's at. Uh, the other thing is kind of keeping your finger on the pulse. And as these conditions uh, persisted, that is the gray, the cool, the wet, um, uh, maybe coming out with a, a mid-season uh, spray. The sprays in organic systems are devolved to for fungal diseases, sulfur products and copper products, and you can there are many formulations and you can use there are six or one half a dozen in the other. Although I like copper better than sulfur because A, it doesn't stink, and B, it comes in a liquid form, which is much easier to put in the tank and spray and it doesn't get clogged like that. Um, and most of the diseases in an orchard, the vector is fallen foliage and fruit on the orchard floor. The spores can stay vital for 15, 18 months and then bounce up into the canopy with rain like that. So orchard floor sanitation is an important thing at some point, particularly in a year like this. Uh, when I get in there and there are a bunch of ways you can handle it, you can just, uh, uh, an easy one is just to mulch over as a physical barrier like that. or. Uh, turn the soil, disrupt the, break up the foliage, disrupt the cycle like that. So, um, I would be remiss if I didn't ask you, oh, here it is, an ad, the admonition again. Uh, uh, I mean, you should keep, you shouldn't let any one year either like buoy you too much or depress you too much. <laughs> These trees will live an easy 50, 75, maybe 100 years. Um, and, you know, there's good years and bad years, and that's all there is to it uh, like that. But I also would be remiss again if I didn't say plan before you plant. And one of the key things is what I call the run-up to planting. And that is strongly suggested that you We'll get into soil a little more here, but you evaluate your soil and you make the adjustments you need to make and you use what I would call the three C's. Cultivation, which is just another word for tillage, compost, and cover crops. And you would start, say, if you were going to plant next January, you would start, oh, I don't know, what are you doing tomorrow morning? Uh, and, and apply compost, usually Orchard rates are about five to 10 tons to the acre. Um, and uh, uh, incorporated, and the deeper the tillage, while when you get there, eventually orchard establishment, orchards are, feature really reduced or even no till. Initially, I'm gonna strongly suggest deep tillage. And that is to work the soil physically, but also to incorporate organic matter. Again, pre-spread compost, uh, turn it in whatever your tillage tools are as deep as you can, and then immediately sow a cover crop. If I were sowing cover crops this afternoon, I would use buckwheat or mustard. I'd grow it, buckwheat, 30, 40 days, it'll be mature. We'd drop it, chop it, turn it in, do it again. But at that point, you might move to fall cover crops, uh, and those are principally a variety of different combinations of annual grasses, oats, rye, barley, triticale, which is a hybrid cross between wheat and rye, and I'm loving it these days. Uh, but also I'm in love with rye. It just has this amazing root system and contributes quite a bit to uh, 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 foliar biomass like that. So what's my point here? Well, there is one. Uh, <laughs> Preceding planting, at least in the previous summer, you're gonna put on compost. And the idea, whether you're working at a garden scale or a field scale, pre-applying compost and then doing your tillage incorporates that material vertically through the depth that you till the soil. If it's six inches or 16 inches, it'll be relatively uniformly distributed in that fashion. Um, so, uh, and then so a cover crop. And basically, organic matter, and uh, is comprised of two kind of branches. One is compost, which has got nutrients, of course, but seriously about carbon loading your soil and raising the organic matter content. And then cover crops, which are also similar, but they're more of a quick flush of nutrients in the uh, subsequent growing season like that. So you do that in the summer and you come out in I'd also advise ordering your trees in advance, at least six months, maybe a year. Um, and uh, uh, 
let me just say these days, buying trees is ouch, sticker shock. Uh, they've tripled in price in the last half dozen or so years. Um, uh, retail trees are going 40 to 60 bucks a pop, wholesale cheaper. Uh, you can also graft your own, as these folks did here uh, uh, initially. It'll take you a couple years to kind of get a sizable tree to plant up. So uh, the run-up to planting, uh, compost, cover crops, deep tillage, order your trees like that. Uh, let me pause here and maybe I affectionately refer to these folks as the boss crows. Uh, uh, former students, uh, friends. And colleagues yeah. still friends and colleagues you know that's kind of yeah, so, yeah we're both friends and colleagues mentor. Right? Mentor, <laughs> that's mister uh, uh, maybe you could just kind of ramble a little bit uh, idea genesis evolution why how it's gone how it's going and you know you never want to we used to go and visit Jim Ryder at a preeminent orchardist in the Paro Valley organic orchard this but I had to be careful with taking students there in the lousy years he said you know I'm gonna break off 30 acres over there and sell it for development in the good years everybody should grow fruit so <laughs> keep that in mind okay <laughs> yeah so or, or kind of the history of our orchard here I guess um, we started uh, fifth grow in 2008 um, but because, um, probably largely because of Oren's influence, we had already grafted trees, kind of hoping <laughs> to plant an orchard. Um, and we found a location here on the ranch. We actually were a little worried about um, soil saturation and, and potential flooding. We'd heard that a field nearby had gotten flooded. So we actually planted them up on the, on the slope a little bit on the other side of the road. Um, all trees that we had grafted ourselves. And I think we just were kind of in love with the idea of having a very diversified farm that would include fruit eventually. The idea of not always bending over to pick the vegetables, but sometimes being able to pick the fruit um, is, is uh, a rewarding idea. And um, I think that ultimately we probably would have been better off planting down here because this is a little bit better soil it's a deeper topsoil up up there it's like not as nutrient rich um, so we learned from that experience and um, we also had the opportunity to see uh, i think we had about 25 28 different varieties um, that and we could see which ones did best in this climate they were all ones that had been recommended by Oren. that kind of more or less did well in Santa Cruz, could handle a similar number of chill hours. So we thought they would do okay here. And we definitely had clear winners and losers. And um, so we kind of, when we transitioned to having a larger orchard down on the, on more of the um, valley floor, as it were, our small, val small valley here, um, we were trying to select like, oh, let's do more, a fewer number of varieties and, um, and focus on the ones that did really well and have more of each of those varieties. And then we grafted them all again, but we were like, well, we really love that one apple, even though it's not that performing that well. So we kind of grafted everything. <laughs> and then uh, we planted them. Again, we, we thought this, this space was too valuable to us for vegetables, so we couldn't find a good, or we didn't think there was a good spot to put our nursery beds. And so we grafted them in a place where we didn't have a good deer fence, unfortunately. And so over the couple of years, we not all of our trees performed uh, great. So then we were sort of forced to plant what survived. And therefore, we came maybe kept a little bit more diversity than we had kind of planned to because we were like, well, we only have... 15 of this one variety we really were hoping to plant 30 or 50 of it but we also have 15 of this other variety that we weren't sure we were going to propagate again but let's go ahead and plant it so we continue to have a very diverse orchard although um, now we do have some greatest hits uh, that we really like and and you know we have more information on what to do in the future too we're always learning um, anything to add? 
Yeah, I think uh, maybe as John was talking, I, I think we have a few sort of suggestions and lessons that we learned. So we decided to pick, we thought, okay, our prime growing ground is down here. It's flat, it's much better soil. Let's find the pieces of soil that aren't as good because apples are gonna do okay. Like tree fruit, this is a long-term perennial. So we'll put it in the marginal zones. And <laughs> as Oren was saying, planning ahead is important. And if you put it in a marginal place, you will have marginal results. Um, so Proximity breeds prosperity <laughs> as far as placement. So we, uh, <laughs> The location, we, we liked it, you know, it was on a slope, but it's in this drainage and it gets a huge amount of water that rushes through the soil during the winter. Uh, and that washes out nutrients. And we, uh, we didn't do, I don't think we did a soil test at all. Or we did a soil test, hey, but folks, it was- always do a soil it's test. A, it's really <laughs> critical, it's really critical. So what happened is in year, maybe it was like the third year, where suddenly things were looking really awful and we did some soil testing and realized that the pH was totally off, probably because it's in this drainage and there's water rushing through the soil all the time, washing stuff that's, that's um, soluble out. Um, so we found ourselves in the situation with that, those trees up there are still there and we are harvesting some of them, but in order to keep it going, it became this treadmill of constantly needing, like we need to amend it every couple of years, have a leaf um, to keep the pH uh, in a good zone. and. Um, it also got scab up there, and once once it's there, it's sort of a matter of time before the trees are going to die. Uh, the other thing I know, John, grew canker, apple canker. Sorry. Um, one of the things that John had mentioned was initially we planted this huge variety of trees, and we did we there were clearly winners, but we had a really hard time letting go of anything. <laughs> and I think that's something to just encourage you all to think carefully about what the, your orchard, how you're going to market your orchard and what the purpose of your orchard is. So we had initially, our, our initial idea was um, an orchard that would allow us to harvest fresh apples going to market without storage. So, you know, fresh apples off the tree, changing seasonally from the earliest point that we could have apples to the latest point that we could have apples fresh off the tree. Uh, but having that much diversity makes it very difficult to market. Um, so if you have an, a variety and you only have, we had 10 trees of each variety roughly, is that right? Yeah. Something like that, 10 to 12 of each variety. Um, first couple years, maybe there were like five or six crates of each. <laughs> <laughs> you bring it to market once, people try it, they love it. Can I get more of that? No, no, you can't. Next year, next year you can have some more. Maybe, maybe if you're lucky. It's hard to create a following and to market when you have so little volume. So you can't, you can't really sell them to restaurants because if the restaurant tries it and says, hey, I really like this, I'll take 15 cases. <laughs> and you're like, no, I only have, <laughs> that was my total yield <laughs> on that variety. Um, so just think about how, what your marketing outlet is going to be, what you're going to be doing with the apples. If you're making cider and you're mixing them all together, then maybe it's not bad to have this huge diversity, but it, it does get very challenging to market. Um, and then when you do note, if there are winners, uh, eliminating those varieties that really perform badly. So we knew, we, we knew certain varieties were not performing and yet we still grafted them and now we have rows of trees and they, you know, we'll have like pristine, which we just finished harvesting. I think we have basically just, is it just one row, two rows? It's two rows over here. And then there's some up in the upper orchard that have survived. Uh, and they yielded uh, like 120 or 130 crates off of those, just those two little rows of trees. We picked all the Gravensteins and we had eight crates. And the Gravensteins, mind you, the trees are twice as big. Beautiful trees. Beautiful trees. <laughs> Beautiful fruit, uh, heirloom fruit. Uh, if I can interject. Huge, larger apples, uh, popular varietal name. Uh, they drop before they're ready. Yeah, uh, all you have to do is look at a gravy uh, cross idol drop on the ground. And so so <laughs> I think John, no, maybe somebody noticed and was like, oh, we should pick the Gravensteins. They're like, okay, we'll do it Monday. And by the time we picked, yeah. I don't know, Licha, how much of the, 
what do you think? ¿Cuántos de, de las manzanas de Gravenstein? ¿Cuánto por ciento se cayó antes de piscar? Como unas cinco cajas. Sí, han caído. Pero, the, so, yeah, it's just like they all fell. Then we picked and we maybe got eight crates total with easily, you know, if you look at the amount of branch space creeks that should be creating apples, it way less than the pristines. And the pristines yielded 150 crates. So, <laughs> so if I could interject, so this speaks to a bunch of things, but uh, some varieties are just flat out more grower friendly, you know, in terms of disease, pests, uh, reliable annual cropping, ability to hold both on the tree and off the tree. Um, my suggestion is still uh, go in the direction of varietal diversity <clears throat> somewhat. That is to say, I think you'll do better in terms of what people like. If you have some sweet and some tart apples in each of the sub-segments of the season, early, mid, and late. And a difficulty is getting good early apples. You mentioned pristine, it's great, and people really respond to it. It's kind of like a wannabe golden delicious. I mean a good golden delicious that's tree ripe and not the ones you get in Safeway and New Leaf, which is just like dead. Uh, um, and the gravity seed is a great apple, but it's just a, a, a problematic and limited apple uh, like that. Another good early variety is a, a derivative of Cox's Orange Pippin called Alchemini, a German uh, variety, and then Sunrise, which was bred at uh, a breeding station called Summerland up in the Fraser River Valley in British Columbia. So, But you're always searching for a good early variety. Mid-season and late uh, uh, season, there are a plethora of varieties. But the idea of having a variety of varieties for each of the subsections like that. And uh, yeah, Gravenstein is one of my favorite apples. I got two trees, and that, that's good enough for me. <laughs> Warren, what was the second variety you said is a good early one, summer, just summer? Uh, Pristine, Gravy, Alchemini, Sunrise. So, yeah, so Alchemini, <laughs> lovely, lovely, lovely <laughs> apple. Punky little tree. It, <laughs> I, what rootstock did we put it on? We can look at our little thing. I mean, it, it's just so funky. I think in talking with Mike, and oh, we tried it on a... a we get it on a, on a, I have the list a wild. But then you end up doing it on, on a standard, so Anticanova? Yeah, yeah, we can look at them. Yeah. And they're like, they're, yeah, so, they're tiny. They're like some and, of the tiniest trees. We can talk rootstocks in a while. A couple of your pages and your handouts have rootstocks uh, stuff. Uh, but uh, you basically... Uh, put a weak variety on a strong rootstock. Rootstock Im influences a lot of things. The main thing is tree size. So weak varieties on strong rootstock, strong varieties like, you know, Gravenstein, Fuji, uh, Mutsu uh, on a weaker rootstock like that. So sight and soil and sun is numero uno, definitely like that. I mean, just flat out, you need a minimum of six to eight hours of direct sunlight from the time the trees bloom in the spring to the time they drop their leaves in the fall. Let me also just say that a little, I could, I could and often make the statement, shade is the enemy of fruit. But uh, on the coast here, we have mild winters. You can get a little more chill for your trees, and I'll define that in a minute, chill hours. Um, if you have a little shade in the winter, it's fine, but not during the growing season. Chill hours. Chill hours is a reference to the cumulative number of hours from fall to spring where temperatures are between 45 and 32 degrees Fahrenheit. And the significance is that uh, all different varieties have different chill hour requirement from low to high. We live in an area that is moderate in terms of the chill hours that we receive, often as little as four to 500, maybe as much as 700. Although having said that, last winter was epic in every way. We had 900 and something, so plenty of chill. I have this one apple at the Chadwick Garden called Candle Sinap. It's from the Sinap Peninsula, juts out in Turkey, Turkey into the Black Sea. Uh, at elevation, and it needs about 1,200 hours of sunlight. And every year, people walk by, and when the tree has not yet come out of dormancy in June, and say, "What's wrong with that tree?" I say, "Well, it's chill hours." So you need to match the chill. It's been recorded everywhere. What is the chill hour 
average for your area. It's easily accessible info. Uh, and in what, every variety of any fruit has been, deciduous fruit has been uh, tagged for chill hours. You just need to match up your chill hours with, of the varieties with the chill hours of, of your area. Having said that, it's not an exact science. Uh, I'm growing trees that have uh, a, a lot of the rusted apples, which are maybe deluxe, uh, uh, 800 or 1,000 hours, and in most years, they get by with quite a bit less like that. So, or and I was going to bring up chill hours. So, yeah. you were talking about microclimates, yeah. and I think that's a good sort of thing to touch on again in a real life situation. So, we uh, this this little microclimate is enough different from just across the street and up around that corner that the harvest is usually delayed when it starts down. This is a, a few weeks earlier, or not a week, maybe a week earlier, would you say? Then like usually it's, it's delayed. So even just the distance from here to here because of the, the different topography changes how many chill hours we get and it changes when things um, bloom and when they ripen. I don't really know. I imagine it's more than Santa Cruz. So probably we're more averaging like the six to 700, yeah, yeah. I would think. If you're at four to five hundred, we notice that between here and Santa Cruz, there's like a two, there's like a two week lag. So yeah. our strawberries are always at least if we see blooming, like ornamental cherries, then we know that if we had a cherry, it'd be two weeks later, usually. So okay, um, yeah, microclimatic yeah, effect colder. is is uh, seemingly subtle, but not. Uh, and uh, maybe we can touch on that. I'm going to read again. Um, Basically, uh, sunlight, you need a minimum of six to eight hours of direct sunlight a day. Eight to ten will be better, spring to fall, uh, like that. And uh, let me just uh, read this here. Um, uh, fruit, as fruit tree, fruit tree growers at the most basic level are farmers of sunlight. The sun drives the orchard system. Sun provides energy that fuels photosynthesis, photosynthesis, the most important reaction on the planet. It gives us first the food chain, and then aided by able growers, the food system. Uh, 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 so it's the most important reaction on the planet. It converts CO2. Plants take in carbon dioxide from the atmosphere through tiny microscopic openings on the underside of the leaves called stomates or stomata. And they take up H2O, water, from the soil through xylem tubes like that. So uh, the process of photosynthesis involves interception of sunlight energy. So the more, in a still size manageable fashion, the more robust your trees, the better the spread of your branches vertically and horizontally, the thicker the darker green leaves, the more photo, it's the manufacturing plant. What's, what's being manufactured and how's that happen? Basically the tree or the plant in general takes the sunlight energy and busts apart the chemical bonds of CO2, carbon dioxide and H2O, water, and recombines them into long carbon chains, which equates to eventually being carbohydrates and sugars. What does the tree use uh, the carbohydrates for? everything. There are structural carbohydrates which give you your, helps to form the cells that form uh, root, flower, fruit, leaf, and branch. And then there are carbohydrates that are partitioned for energy. So uh, while I said that shade is the enemy of fruit, true, uh, there's another kind of pseudo haiku goes something along the lines of the more sunlight you intercept, the more fruit you're going to get. And it's not a real haiku, but sort of like that. Uh, and also, and they don't know exactly 100% why, but there seems to be something about a higher photosynthetic activity level in the tree, uh, tree triggers it to produce more fruit than wood. And that's kind of what, that's, that's our bias like that. So if you look at, let's kind of transition a little bit. Let's look at, uh, uh, <clears throat> what was supposed to be the first page in your handout, but, but it isn't. The one that says slopes and sunlight. Um, is that existent? Somewhere, maybe, hopefully. Uh, yep, there you go. Uh, so it uh, looks a lot like this. It's pretty colored uh, Xerox like that. Okay, let's kind of uh, 
there's a lot embedded in this page here. Uh, uh, we've referenced microclimate several times and uh, uh, site selection. I mean, the question is, particularly for the home gardener, do you select the site or does the site select you? Now, when you're on a piece of ground or you're looking for a piece of ground or you have a farm, you want to walk the ground and look and consider the totality of the conditions for selecting your, your site. But if you can, a gentle south-facing slope, as indicated in the top uh, graphic here, uh, is a distinctly warmer microclimate. When I say warm, I mean uh, both the air and the soil will be warmer. And if you look at this graphic here, the deal is why is because on a, and I, when I say south facing slope, I mean like less than six degrees, four to six degrees, something like that. Um, on a slope, south facing slope in the northern hemisphere, in the southern hemisphere, it's the opposite. We could say equator ward facing, but that's awkward. Uh, so on a south facing slope in the northern hemisphere, the sun hits the ground at a more straight on perpendicular angle and it delivers more heat energy again to air and soil as indicated on this graphic, the little yellow bump here, in a more concentrated area, fancy way of saying it, it's just going to be warmer <laughs> and warmth is good. You look at flat ground, it's more dispersed and north facing slopes, ridiculous, it's just, just too, too, too dispersed like that. Uh, so if you have that ability, a gentle south facing slope is a good one. It has a lot of pros and it can have some cons we'll get to in a minute. Let's look at the bottom, the lay of the land thing. I have to say I love this graphic, the lay of the land here. So again, if we look at what's called the direction of a slope in geography and agroecology is called the aspect. Fancy. Uh, aspect rating, if we look at the bottom thing here, the south facing slope is going to be the warmest. Flat ground, less so. And again, I would just say, unless you live in a wickedly hot area, rule out north slopes like that. Uh, okay, so, uh, but slopes and at elevation can be also wind exposed. Wind is tough on plant growth. And basically when the, particularly young trees, when the uh, trees are buffeted by wind, instead of extending growth, they thicken their stem and leaf. So it's just not getting the growth you want. When we started out at the UCSC farm, uh, like, uh, prevailing westerly winds so that the young trees, we train a branch like this I I into the wind, and by mid-season it was like that, and we had to tie them into place like that. So, you know, it's a consideration. Uh, also, wind during the bloom period discourages the winged insects from pollinating, so wind protected is good uh, like that. Um, and then the soil rating, which is not inconsiderable, very beautiful. Some people call them sacred south slopes. Yeah, sure. But it's skinny soil comparatively. Bottom land is thicker, richer soil. A couple analogies. Teresa was just mentioning up the hill there versus here. This has deeper soil. The Sierras, rocky outcrops, granite, slate. Central Valley, 40 foot of soil, where'd it come from? The Sierras, like that. So bottom land, uh, river bottom land, stream side, usually is a much deeper, richer soil profile. Okay, that's the upside. It's so much easier also to work, whether it's on foot or with machinery, on flat ground than on sloping land like that. So you've got to weigh all these factors. Uh, but uh, some of the negatives of the flat ground, rich, deep soil, deposited over geological time, perhaps. Uh, what is your drainage? Fruit trees have poor tolerance for standing water. Pears probably better than any other species uh, like that. Um, and so what you do in one of your site assessment things is you do what's called a perk test, percolation test. Dig a hole foot by a foot, fill it with water, let it drain, fill it again, count, the clock's ticking, how long does it take to drain? Uh, assume it's not during the monsoon season. Uh, uh, it should drain within two to four hours, certainly overnight, or else you've got too wet ground, you need to pick another site like that. Um, and then uh, when we're talking soil, it's critical to, uh, just it's like a baseline study to uh, assess your soil. There are two main routes you can go uh, for soil assessment. Uh, one is quantitative and it's quite simple. And uh, let John speak to their specific soil here in a sec. Uh, 
And it's just you get a soil test, you get it analyzed, and you get a baseline reading of what are the macro and micronutrients, what's the pH, what's the CEC, the cation exchange capacity, which means basically the ability of your soil to hold and exchange nutrients for plant growth, uh, and on like that. Uh, and for instance, if you're lacking in phosphorus, you can't cycle phosphorus. You have to go and get an organic phosphorus source and put it on and then retest like that. So it just gives you a baseline of, and, and there's a thing called the law of the minimum with plant nutrients. And they illustrate it in the old textbooks with a, a wooden stave barrel. And one of the staves, like phosphorus, is shorter than the other, so the water pours out. And basically, the, the take home is, if all of your macro and micronutrients aren't up to a sufficient level, and that varies in terms of the amount per, per uh, nutrient, how shall I put it? Plant don't grow. Uh, like that. So you are informed and you adjust and you continue to monitor. It's pretty cut and dry. Um, and uh, the other, well, actually you want to, turns out this gentleman here, and I use the term loosely. Uh, oh, no, no, let me rephrase it. This gentle man has some of their soil tests. Uh. Yeah, well, this is the most recent soil test we took on the land uh, where the trees are planted, and um, we use it to kind of decide how we're going to fertilize or whether we need to fertilize. Um, typically, we're just adding a little bit of uh, nitrogen if we can, especially when the trees are young and still really need to grow. Um, What's but your we're, nitrogen source of... We're i um, very interested in the pH level and whether we might need to add calcium and we want to see the organic matter going up. Um, our source of nitrogen, well, we, recently we used some of our old chicken poop that we've been gathering because we, in addition to raising vegetables, flowers, fruit, berries, um, dry beans, we also uh, raise um, eggs. So, and we, because we don't have like an active composting program where we're really turning that compost frequently enough to have it, to like spread it on our veggie fields and know that it's going to work, we've sort of accumulated it and finally we decided like, oh, well, you can at least put it on the fruit trees. Um, and that's one source, but otherwise we do just buy like a... a or uh, an available organic fertilizer. And that, we, we've used sustain most, over the years. Most farmers. Um, sometimes we just use the tr the stuff we get from a, a a company called True Organic that we use for our veggies, um, and just to give uh, the trees a little bit of a boost. Yeah, I, I will say that uh, manure is a good source of nitrogen. Variably, that uh, any bird manure is the highest nitrogen and the highest phosphorus containing of manure. So. Uh, we use horse manure principally at the Chadwick Garden, and the reason is we can get it free, loaded, it's available. It's got like 0.5% nitrogen. Chicken manure generally 2 to 4% like that, so it's a very uh, effective organic manure uh, nitrogen source. Yeah? How do you, do you ever put your chickens like through the orchard? <laughs> Well, if you look, if you look through the trees, you might see our little home chicken coop. We have, so we have 750 or seven, roughly 700 hens um, in a pastured system. And then we have, we have miniature chickens. We have a bunch of bantams <laughs> that are just for the house, Feral. for the kids. Um, it's like, you know, for, you know, just you, for you, fun. You but you could. Yeah, the, the main, yeah. We, we can't. So when we first started, we had this idea that we would be moving our chicken operation as part of a rotation, and um, is it was almost impossible to get a liability insurance. So, in order to sell at farmers markets, you need to have liability insurance, and nobody wanted to carry us with just this like we have chickens and we have vegetables and we have we have baby greens and we have chickens, <laughs> um, and they did not want to see us moving, you know, rotating right. as part of our plan, um, and it. it I remember it was kind of a crisis because we had one insurance who found out that like, they, we, we, we went to a couple different brokers before someone finally found us, somebody who would take us. And um, that was one of their big concerns was the chicken operation. So there's what you might think is ideal. And then the reality that uh, food safe, you know, USDA food safety program, et cetera, dictates other things. 
Um, and it, it also turned out not to be, we, we did initially try to establish pasture with this idea that we would have a multi-year rotation, the chickens on pasture for a few years and then move them. And um, chickens are very aggressive on pasture, especially in the winter. And it turned out not to really be feasible because to establish good enough pasture um, that it'll hold up in the winter, you need multiple years. It, it, it really takes a while to firmly establish, so rotation didn't work that great. Moving them in and amongst trees, they fly up in the trees. Uh, also when we first started, we were on the site. young trees at the base. Yeah, so we, we, you know, the way it would work is you'd put, what we have now is we have fencing between the aisles, but you've got this very awkward fencing structure. You can't really have very many. It's very difficult to move them then your trees have to be further apart, which isn't necessarily what you want for space. Yeah, it's funny so how it, one little input into a system can twist the system like that, and you have to manage for that. So, you know, one again, thing I was if you gonna, have a few trees at home, you could work out a, a system with caging and like that. But, and there's also the issue of predators at night. <laughs> yeah, so we do have our little home flock that's slowly moving their way through here, but nothing is part of, like, an actual system. But I did, I think we didn't mention that we especially early on, we did do compost applications. Mm -hmm. um, and then we we do a lot of mulching. So that's, you know, it's a long-term investment, yeah. um, but we have mulched heavily and frequently. Um, right. Yeah. I, I, couldn't, I couldn't find a soil sample from like 2010, like very early on, but um, I believe that most of the land here was kind of at the one to 2% organic matter. And now um, our orchard is hovering above five percent. So we over time, jump we've, in here we've say, added quite a bit. That's <clears throat> effing phenomenal. <laughs> to, it's really difficult to raise organic matter significantly on a farm scale, and then these folks, through their various methods, have done that. I mean, they do have a clay-based soil, I believe, so that's more receptive to holding nutrients. Yeah. You guys yeah, use soil we, control we've lab? We've been using soil control lab. They're based in Watsonville. Um, and we asked them for a complete soil test. So it gives you quite a lot of information. Um, some of it I need help interpreting. Um, at the farm we've used for three or four decades, um, capital A and capital L uh, Western soil labs. They're in Modesto, I think. And uh, they're really uh, reliable. Let me just say, there's a lot of variability in soil labs, and soil control is good. A and L is excellent. And what I like about A and L is they'll just give you uh, written, and then you can go back and forth in conversation about how to adjust. We grow organically. Okay, you know, here are your nitrogen sources. These amounts per square foot per acre, like that. And then uh, they're just really good at customer service. So A and L Western Labs. Uh, no, they're in Modesto, but soil control is 24 Hangar Way, I believe, is the address out by the airport. Uh, they used to be on Highway 1. I loved it. It was 1234 Highway 1. What a great address. Uh, but that was then. That was before the Loma So do you course. mail in the samples? To, yeah, yeah. Uh, we just mail them in. Uh, uh, you can go online, get the A&L Western Labs, soil labs, and they'll tell you the protocols for taking a sample. But let me just say, they need two cups, not... 20 pounds, <laughs> like that. So, so they'll actually send you a little like coffee bag that's the right amount, or you can just use a, a couple quart bags like that. Let, let's move along a little bit. Also in your hand, uh, so sunlight for photosynthesis, of course, and everything you need in terms of forming the tree and growing the tree. But let's look at two handouts. They're both entitled sunshade within the tree canopy. It's a, a, a line graph and the other sunshade within the tree canopy is a little pictorial thing. Let's look at the sunshade within the tree uh, canopy, a little graph. Everybody see that? Here's the deal. It's like you got a nice big tree. The outside of that canopy intercepts almost 100% sunlight. You need a high degree of sunlight striking branches to manufacture and maintain fruit wood, fruit buds like that. And you need 50% of the 100% that falls from the sky. Uh, so it's a high light need. No problem on the exterior of the tree. This graph shows you what happens when you get about three foot into the tree canopy, unaided, light doesn't move more than that. You're down to that 
threshold of maybe not having enough sunlight. Uh, and then if you look at the uh, other uh, graphic, the sunshade within the tree canopy, it's just, again, the outside shell of the tree, you got big, bumping, colorful, delicious fruit. You come in, but that's only 20% of the canopy. You come in another 20%, that dark line there, yeah, you got some fruit, it's okay. And you get to the core of the tree, which is 60% of the volume of the canopy. This is what I call the zone of firewood production. Uh, and if you look at a lot of older big trees, they don't even have enough sunlight to support leaf, let alone fruit growth there. So what's the take home here? There are two take homes in terms of managing sunlight. Grow a healthy tree that again has a good canopy that has thick leaves that are out and exposed. Uh, grow uh, semi-dwarf trees. Um, you're just going to be, they're more size manageable. Say I had a six foot by six foot tree um, and sunlight moves three, four feet into a canopy. Okay, I'm kind of covered almost no matter how I prune and train and shape that tree. The bigger the tree, the more difficult it is to get sunlight into the interior. So you have two aspects of sunlight management. Interception, yeah, but infiltration into the core of the tree. And so uh, what you need to do is to learn how to shape and prune your trees. I'm not gonna go into it today, but there are two tutorials in these handouts on how to shape the two most common tree forms. The open set, everybody go like this. All right, congratulations, you just formed a beautiful five-armed open center tree. I'm not kidding. So it's basically that, a vase, a cup like that. Uh, it's a handful. Uh, uh, and then it's the simplest, uh, easiest tree form to both instruct on, to learn, and to create. And thus it's the most common uh, tree form. Uh, the other is more complex and more fruitful, but more difficult. It's called the Modified Central Leader. You can look at the tutorial uh, if you want uh, like that. So uh, the size of your tree affects sunlight management and the shape of your tree affects sunlight management. Uh, okay, questions? Oh, hey, we're here in an orchard. Folks, tell us about your layout. <laughs> What's the deal? Uh, species, number of trees, varieties, in-row spacing, alley width. What are you doing with the orchard floor? Uh, uh, oh, irrigation. John's the expert, right? Well, just to, on tree form, I know you didn't mention that, but we've selected to mainly do, like we pretty much only do open center just because it was the easiest for us to visualize and teach um, people to prune for us when... Um, uh, when we're pruning. So you can see that here um, where, you know, there's the main laterals coming out and then there's like space in the middle. Can everybody go like this and then look at that. It's just that equal distance between the branches around the 360 degrees of the trunk. They come up and out at about a 60, 70 degree angle. Good spacing between them. I'm going to jump in here. Sorry, John. Uh, <laughs> I'm like that. Uh, so what you're trying to do is create an alley of light down into the core of the tree so you have that requisite 50 percent sunlight how do you know if you're doing that you got fruit you're doing it you don't the tree's talking to you in a sense you also can use a get a cheap photographer's light meter and you can measure it it's kind of fun but after a while you come to recognize i call it dappled sunlight in the core of the tree and do you have fruit or not yeah, and this particular row is not representative of our layout because the trees are very close together. I think we were actually planning on relocating some of these later, but then we let them grow in place. And it's kind of a fun experiment to see how productive they can be only like three feet apart from each other. But typically what we have here is a 10 by um, 15 foot spacing. So we have 15 feet between rows of trees and 10 feet between each tree. And we're trying to kind of get those trees to occupy that space without encroaching on the sunlight of their neighboring tree. That also gives us space to operate a tractor in the, in the middle. Like, you know, there's more space here than we need. Um, we, these trees could be closer together, but then we wouldn't be able to mow between them. Um, for several years, we actually 
would till the alleyways and cover crop to bring in um, organic matter and break up this cycles of disease and so forth. But over time, we we moved to a permanent um, ground cover where we were able to mow and that allows us not to till the soil and just let the organic matter build up that way where the soil biology can be happy. It also reduces compaction from foot traffic and whatnot up and down the aisles in the summer, reduces dust too. And uh, eventually, even maybe this morning, these true tree roots will come out into the alley and the effect of the root mass of grasses, particularly perennial grasses, is phenomenal. They are all, on an almost daily basis, grasses are losing or sloughing off roots and manufacturing new ones. So as, even as they grow, they're adding organic matter to the soil. By not tilling your soil, you're increasing your microbial life that breaks down this organic matter of the root detritus. And so it's a really, basically it's, 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 it's being biologically smart. Uh, like I said, initially you're going to need to do, strongly recommend some deep tillage, but eventually, minimal like that. I know I know some orchardists really like the idea of having a permanent understory even pretty close to the trees. I've, I've been reading a little bit more about people who are doing more no-till stuff, but our experience has been then, it might sound really romantic, but it's very difficult to deal with irrigation. If you have, that's part of why we have such a wide space kind of under the under the drip line of the, of the branches um, wood chipped is because um, if you let stuff grow, then you've got stuff that's getting in the way of your micro sprinklers um, and irrigation systems, and um, also a pathway for ants to farm aphids. Um, if you've got a bunch of grass and it's yeah, you know, the plant up bridges high to the tree. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, just a little anecdote here. Just add in about the use of mulches. My preferred substance of choice these days is uh, wood chips, Ramiel wood chips. Uh, and they can be procured usually even for free or low cost. Uh, if you contact tree services, they will dump it on your property. Um, and uh, uh, you spread. At the Chadwick Garden, we use about three inches both in the spring and in the fall. Um, and this is pure carbon. So you would think it takes ages to break down, but once you get going in the system, you're fostering a range of microbes, particularly a mouthful called actinomycetes. I could spell it, but I won't. Uh, 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 that are kind of a hybrid. They're single cell like bacteria, but they have my uh, uh, hyphae -like, like fungi and they're just, they eat wood. So it breaks down rapidly and it, leaches the nutrients that are in the wood chips into the soil and more so the top maybe four six eight inches over time gets I don't know it's not really a soil science but the soil the look of it the feel the physical nature of it is <clears throat> dank it's just phenomenal uh, and we don't feature a lot of earthworm populations in our soils here and it's a climate related thing but in the areas where we use these ramiel wood chips on a tree we have a pretty good proliferation of, of, of earthworms also can suppress weeds <coughs> somewhat particularly annual weeds not so much perennial weeds uh, perennial I see you have bindweed here yikes uh, uh, Perennial weeds are just most difficult. So how do you manage the, you just hoe the weeds? Yeah, the bindweed, we we haven't, we had kind of one zone over here. I remember early on before we had trees that had bindweed and it's very difficult to manage. It's just, con yeah, just hand weeding. <laughs> um, and it's a pain in the butt. What's that? Uh, we just, we hoe, it's not very frequently, maybe, maybe we go through three times a year, Monday? Con una pala, yeah, with like, our crew prefers, instead of a hula hoe, they prefer like a, a shovel and they just kind of skim. Um, one thing that, you know, we, has been tricky to, you know, we have our perspective of wanting to leave the weeds in place to rot and feed the roots and that has been difficult to translate when you have a crew of people doing it because what they find what is an efficient way to do it 
um, that requires less labor may not be the way that you would <laughs> like it to happen. So in general, what happens is it gets skimmed and a lot of the weeds end up in here. In yeah, in the pathways. Yeah. So you're not using any mechanical cultivation? We are. We, I, I don't think, we, yeah, we haven't discovered a way to do that really effectively. One thing that does really help is if we do, it is a lot of labor to spread the mulch, but then if we have done a thick mulch layer that year, that will greatly reduce the amount of weeding necessary. Uh, yeah, we either, you know, lately um, we've found it to be most efficient to just have a small load in the back of a gator mm -hmm. and just have people working that way, and then you're reloading frequently, but we've done well, it multiple uh, explain ways. Explain the jargon of a gator here, John. Um, <laughs> gator is just like a little, uh, it's a John Deere's brand of a small ATV that has like a, a bed in the back, like a small pickup truck, like a tiny pickup truck. Um. Yeah, uh, uh, you can use, a, the technical term is ramial wood chips, which means wood chips from branches that are less than three inches in diameter that are deciduous trees that have just been freshly chopped down. You can't get those in this area, that's the back east, so we, it, we use the Campus Tree Cruise chips. They have both fresh and age. I really like the age ones. You'll see these white mycelial strands. The decomp process has already started and it accelerates once it gets on the soil. But also the species of trees in this area are largely uh, conifers, dug fir and redwood and the dreaded uh, from down under eucalyptus. And the admonition is don't use conifers, don't use eucalyptus as a mulch, that they have uh, alkaloids, this and that. Uh, and so whenever I hear don't do something, of course I run out and I do it, but I don't do it on a large scale. I say, well, yeah, yes, no. And the truth of the matter is this is not like taking wood chips and turning them into your soil in the garden. Don't you do it, don't you do it. Don't you? Okay. Uh, 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 this is a surface mulch, and it, they, they, I've been doing it for 40 years. Not only are there no deleterious effects, it's bumping. It's crazy. It's good. <laughs> and like I said, it, there are some instances where I'm thinking we could, once when you are trying to get your trees established, say year one to three. Uh, bring it, you know, fertilizer, a particular high nitrogen fertilizer, um, uh, compost, uh, cover crops, green manures, etc. Once established, a lot of our trees in the garden, we just run on the wood chips as the sole source of input and fertility. Sometimes as the trees go dormant in the fall, we'll come and apply that fall application of wood chips, scatter so a cover crop, typically a grass and a legume, typically uh, these days uh, rye or triticale and bell beans, grow it up to this height and then just drop it with a machete, this is garden scale, and chop it a little bit and mulch over it again in the spring. And it's just phenomenal. Uh, you don't have to really worry about sunburn too much here in general. Uh, so we tend to manage for a more open canopy because, well, look, we don't get a lot of sun. And so we want as much in fall as we can get. Now, occasionally in August, and September, and October, when you get those heat waves, absolutely, you'll get some sunburn. If you lived in the valley, you would have a much denser canopy because of the high incidence of sunlight. Yeah, we had uh, in 2020, and I think the year before, I think in 2019 and 2020, we had, you're not worried about the branches, they're fine, but the, the fruit will get sunburned, especially once it's close to harvest. So we had all of our Honeycrisp and a couple other varieties, just, it, we had a heat wave, it was like 100 degrees, and they, they all just big, huge, cooked, they just cooked them. It just cooked everywhere where the sun was hitting the fruit. Um, it just cooked the fruit on the tree. But one thing I wanted to mention about wood chips is be very cautious. Make don't eucalyptus. No. <laughs> well, no of the, of the tree crew and what they, what they yeah, just be very cautious about eucalyptus. We put a row. We put our two rows of Honeycrisp right under the eucalyptus, and the first, the closest row to the eucalyptus, you can just see if we walk over there that they're being Wait, killed. Trees or chips? Both. 
Yes, but it's the the dead material ends up falling like the leaf litter. The effect. Yeah. Right. And is causing an allelopathic effect, which, you know, supposedly that allelopathic effect is it's inhibiting germination, but it also inhibits growth. So if you look at the, the closer they are, the trees, the closer they are to the eucalyptus, the worse they look. And I, we use that eucalyptus, you can see it here for our, for cut flower. We use it for cut flower production. We use it as filler. And um, as we, you know, we'll cut down big branches and then it just gets dropped and dropped and dropped. And I think over the course of time, we've accumulated a lot of broken down eucalyptus material on those rows and it's, it, they look really bad. <laughs> so. Uh, there are sometimes some eucalyptus chips in with the tree crew stuff, and I haven't noticed any deleterious effects. But it's largely, the campus largely has uh, madrone, uh, uh, dug fir, and redwood like. Yeah, that. I mean, it's so. possible that it's just the effects of the roots, but my suspicion is that it's also yeah, the no. material falling. Uh, and caveat emptor, buyer beware, watch out for uh, free eucalyptus chips. Um, okay, John, you want to talk to him about. Uh, uh, your irrigation system, which is, uh, I think, a really good one. Let me just say there's a variety of different ways you can uh, manage your uh, trees for irrigation. You can't overhead sprinkle them. That's not that efficient and uh, can be very dangerous in the spring, early season with inducing leaf diseases. Uh, on the other hand, in a hot, dry summer, it can uh, clean off the leaves and facilitate photosynthesis. It's not a very efficient form. Of, uh, if on a, under ideal conditions, which would be modern temps, and low wind when you're rain, sprinkling with a rain bird or some sort of overhead sprinkler. Max efficiency is probably about 70 plus 80 percent. That is 70 to 80 percent of the water you're emitting actually gets into the soil. Some is blown off as vapor, some is on the foliage, some is downwind like that. So the idea of sub-irrigation, uh, there are a variety of really good for orchards, uh, inline drip products, the one we've been using for 50 years, which is definitely going to give you a sticker shock, but we've had it for 15 years. There's no UV light degradation, never clogs, even with well water. Uh, it's a product uh, by a company, it's called Techline CV from a company called Netafin, and it's pretty much state of the art. Turn around, Teresa. Turn around so they can see the back of your sweatshirt. <laughs> okay, uh, this advertisement is brought to you by Paro Valley Irrigation. Uh, they give you, you buy stuff, they give you stuff. Hats, jackets, yeah, sweatshirts. Yeah, you spend like $50,000 buying a jacket. You could get a complete <laughs> outfit, you know. Uh, but uh, my point here is in, in Wattsville, an excellent company for irrigation supplies and particularly Dickie Pichot. He'll help you design any system you want for anything you have. He's amazing. I also have to give him kudos about 10 years ago. He started uh, a kind of study group session for trying to get women in irrigation in agriculture. Uh, but they have fabulous products and really they, they'll even come out and do site visits to farms and such like that. Um, so you can have inline drip, you can have overhead, or you can use micro sprinklers. As I said, we use this, uh, I didn't say it. We use this micro sprinkler. Uh, it, the company is Nan Dan Jane, as in Jane the religion. And uh, it's uh, called, uh, Aquamaster 2002, and it was good then and it's still good now, but in 2005 they came up with a similar one that just has a little wider spread, about eight feet like that. I really like micro sprinkles. I like the idea of wetting the whole area to encourage root growth out to the maximum potential like that. Again, the more area you wet, the more weeds will germinate, yet so there's trade-offs there. Um, uh, so, but that's uh, getting maximum root extension, I like. And then these folks have a system here. Yeah, so similar to, this is also considered a micro sprinkler. And uh, here the trees are closer together, so we don't have them in between each tree. But typically we'd have them spaced basically every 10 feet too, like the trees, one on either side. And then it creates a nice wetting surface over a large area. You're also watering your alleyways a little bit. But because uh, tree roots tend to grow out uh, wide and not that deep, I think it makes sense for us to try to water a large area. 
and these do so very um, uniformly. This uh, is from the company Nelson, and these are R5 pop-ups. I particularly, and, and I think they discontinued making this particular um, style, but it only comes up when it's pressurized, and that prevents um, bugs from making little nests in the tiny little orifice there, which I have found can be a problem in places where we don't have the pop-ups. So I really like these. It, it helps to have like a pump that can pressurize your system. And because the hole is so small, uh, this wouldn't be an issue with like domestic water, but because we're pulling from a creek, we do need to filter the water before it goes through the system. And then a nice sturdy uh, upright there. A lot of micro sprinklers are you know, a little chintzy in that regard. The other thing is I can't, I can recount the number of times I've been out in the orchard to kind of summer pruning and crunch, crunch, stepping on the micro. So this kind of fixed placement and uh, sturdy system, I, I think it's the most excellent. But like I said, I also like that Nandan Jane uh, uh, Aquamaster um, like that. Um, let me just say a few other things about water. <clears throat> let me just say this. Water is the pulse of the planet. <laughs> it's necessary for life, of course. But... Uh, I mentioned photosynthesis and the importance of photosynthesis. You look in the textbooks and it says photosynthesis only happens in an aqueous solution. That means there needs to be water in the leaf to fuel the process. Again, uh, sunlight energy breaking apart CO2 and H2O. You got to get the H2O up into the leaf to make photosynthesis happen. So you've got to keep your trees watered on a regular basis and you want to pay particularly attention to hot stretches. It takes a number of hours, if not overnight, for water applied to the soil to get up and into the leaf. So it's critically important for photosynthesis. The other thing is the way that nutrients get into plants, in this case trees, is they're first dissolved. It doesn't matter if it's a compost, is it a green manure, is it a mulch, is it a, a high nitrogen fertilizer, organic fertilizer like sustain. Uh, it needs to be dissolved into what's called the soil solution which is a fancy word for the soil water. And then it's taken up into the plant, through the roots, up xylem tubes into the plant and distributed throughout the plant. Nutrients, in essence, hitchhike a ride up from the soil into and throughout the plant with water. Keep your trees well watered. Having said that, you also need a swing, an oscillation between wet and dry. Constantly wet soil floods the air out of the pore space between the solids of the soil, and you're going to run into anaerobic conditions, root rot. So, uh, water is not unimportant. What's your watering schedule? How do you, we just do ETO? Uh, we, we try to match the ETO, the evapotranspiration rate, and we're typically trying to just water once a week. All of our trees, almost all of them, are on a semi-dwarfing rootstock, so the roots aren't going super deep, so we're not relying on like one irrigation a month that goes really, really deep. We kind of need to provide water every single week, but we're not trying to water every day either. Right. Um, uh, this ETO is something that's recorded for each area we get. Basically, we lose about an inch of water uh, a week, so we replace it. And if you look, uh, UC Davis, uh, CIMIS, uh, the acronym, uh, C-I-M-I-S, they have all the different areas around the state. What is the what is the what this week's ETO? So you can uh, go off that. But basically, it's going to be about an inch a week, so uh, uh, like that. Um, okay. Uh, and yeah, at the farm, we used to, in the early days, we watered four inches a month. And then we watered two inches every two weeks. And now we water one inch a week. And it's just that idea of replacement and yet letting the soil dry out enough in between irrigations like that. And our weather is so ambient and consistent, you know, spring to fall by and large, that that's what it's gonna be, an inch a week like that. Um, I wanted to say a few other things. Uh, uh, m mostly about rootstocks and tree sources. Rootstocks, again, uh, my recommendation is to use not the extreme dwarfing rootstocks, but semi-dwarfing rootstocks. And for apples, two, a couple, three good ones, one called M7. 
give you a 10, 12 foot tree, depending on the vigor of the variety like that. Can be kept shorter through pruning. Uh, and then Geneva testing station for Cornell has these really nice ones, G30 and G935. They're about the same in terms of an eight to 10 or 12 foot tree like that. Um, and then on weak varieties, as we're uh, dissing the most marvelous tasting Alchemini apple, but it's a weak as all get out, uh, a stronger root stock like uh, M111 or even stronger like that. Um, uh, there is a handout that lists common apple and pear and stone fruit rootstocks there. Uh, with stone fruits, basically citation, th there aren't as many dwarfing rootstocks with uh, either pears or the stone fruits. Semi-dwarf is the best you can do. For instance, these pears are on probably a OH cross F3, old home cross farming day stale 333, it's a mouthful. Um, and it's probably the most effective semi-dwarfing rootstock. And my uh, response is, really? It's not very. That's how vigorous inherently pears are. It's best you're going to be able to do. Uh, with uh, stone fruits, uh, plums, uh, pluots, uh, prunes, uh, peaches and the like, citation is your kind of rootstock of choice to go to. Uh, having said that, there's a uh, genetic delayed incompatibility between the citation rootstock and peaches. Tree gets off, it's growing, it's good, it's fruiting. About five to six years, it takes a nosedive. So I use a more vigorous, it's sometimes called a standard rootstock, called Lovell, L-O-V-E-L-L. -L. And I can keep the tree, you know, size manageable, but it's less prone to this fade at maturity like that. Uh, uh, and as I said, uh, tree sourcing is a little bit difficult. You can graft your own, but it'll take you a couple, three years to establish a plantable tree. And uh, uh, good nursery, I, I mostly try to buy organic trees, of which there are very few nurseries. Trees of antiquity down in Passeropolis is par excellence. The trees are now costing 50 bucks each, which is pretty pricey like that. Uh, rain tree up in uh, northwest uh, Washington is really good in terms of having an amazing array of varieties but on limited rootstock. They have most of their trees on a rootstock called M26 which is about as dwarfing as M7 uh, so you can check them out. Uh, uh, they'll also sell you grafting wood so if you want variety X you can buy some sticks to graft from them for a pretty, pretty cheap price like that. Um, Stark Brothers in uh, Missouri is really good. Uh, they have more and more organic offerings and they have high quality trees and a pretty good range of varieties, not so much a range of rootstocks. Uh, Dave Wilson out in uh, Modesto uh, in the Valley, probably the biggest and best nursery in the world. Except unless you're going to buy 200 more trees from them, you can't get them direct. But you can order them through, like I order mine, as many as 40 or 50 through uh, San Lorenzo Garden Center like that. Uh, they've got a, a diversity of both varieties and rootstocks. Van Well is typical of a really big company up in the Northwest. And I can't believe it, but they'll sell you and me one tree. And it'll be much cheaper than almost any other source. And if you get up to having seven, eight, ten trees, the price comes down. And if you're buying like 50 of one variety on a, uh, the same root stuff, you probably can get the tree price down around or just under 10 bucks. So again, just depends on uh, how many trees you're buying and, and, all, and all that. Um, so organically, you're supposed to buy and plant or organically produce trees. Um, but the thing of it is, uh, there's a little bit of a workaround in that. Uh, the trees really don't ta start producing for three to five years. So by the time you stick this non-organic tree in the ground, grow it organically, you've transitioned and you're okay to start t selling fruit when that tree starts to fruit out at three to five years like that. Um, I think maybe, I don't know, I'll stop. Uh, and uh, you'll say thanks. Uh, and uh, I mean, like, whew, thanks. Uh, you could. Yeah, we got 20 minutes. No, no. Let me just say that uh, we could take questions or whatever you want. And then also, we'll be offering, as I said, a series of winter season planting, early season and early year care and pruning, both young trees and established trees at the UCSD Farm and Garden. We're also, the last two years, we've offered and play an offer again, a citrus uh, 
uh, workshop uh, too in the winter, early spring like that. Um, so check the Center for Agroecology at UCSC and you'll see the listings of our uh, upcoming uh, workshops. Questions? Uh, oh, like that? <laughs> no, no, here's a gopher throw right here. <laughs> we do have gophers for sure, and um, it is a big concern, especially with young trees. You want to stay on top of trapping if you can. They'll take out big trees too <laughs> if you let them go. <laughs> we No, um, we've tried gopher baskets, not with the trees because we're putting in so many, um, but with other long-term perennials and we've just, they can save your tree, but your tree won't grow very well. Yeah, that's the point at which they just the inhibit roots the root get growth. girdled by the mesh. So unless it's, like if it's in, I, I think you just got a trap. <laughs> Regular yeah, we trapping just, we, we have somebody on our, our staff who is, just a born hunter, um, <laughs> Gabby, and he just, yeah, he's out here all the time. Whenever he has a minute, he's trapping and just constant trapping. Yeah. Do you have a list of your varieties? We do. We do have a list of varieties. Actually, There's a yeah, lot of them. I think Jim and I have I that. We could send them it to you, Dave. <laughs> yeah, like, you know, write a recommendation for this area. Um, I, I, one of the things that we have observed is that Things are very different microclimatically too, but um, I mean, some of the ones, year year. and even year to year, like we had a few years in a row where um, Hudson's Gold Gem, we love Hudson's Gold Gem, and it it did so beautifully. And then we've had years where it doesn't, even with thinning, you know, like um, it's not like just necessarily just a, a alternate bearing thing um the other other ones well pristine we've had really great success with great volume but it's not an apple for everybody it's a pretty tart apple um sunrise like i as much as alchemini is delicious i would if you're doing if you're growing commercially i wouldn't recommend it um but sunrise is a really nice apple not super vigorous either probably a really short on and off the tree window too it's it holds a lot better than pr pristine drops mm. really readily for us um and like the sunrise just kind of sit there we can kind of be like oh well you know we'll hit everything else that's more important huh. until the sunrise and and then go to the sunrise um and it's a really pleasant apple yeah. it we initially kind of were like eh, yeah. eh. um but now it, we're like gosh we could use a couple more rows of this of year you're eating an apple you're eating a uh, we just finished our sunrise harvest. You're eating an apple in early August. It's the best apple in the world ever. <laughs> you're eating a, a GD Granny Smith in January when you're pruning. It's the best apple in town. It just really depends on the season and so much on your, my, anybody's taste buds and preferences. And that's why one of the reasons I said to have a variety of sweet and semi-sweet and tart apples to meet different people's needs like that. So. Yeah, I mean, uh, other, well, well Enterprise, Mutsu, has performed Mutsu. Very well. Mutsu is a Japanese uh, cross between an obscure uh, apple called Janet's Rawl from Carolinas and uh, uh, Fuji, I believe. Uh, anyhow, it's a very big apple, a Japanese apple. It's green, but super sweet. And then you, you find it, it's even sweeter, Teresa, in storage. You like Mutsu after a while yeah, in storage? Yeah, Mutsu, Mutsu is one of the only apples that we have that really truthfully tastes so much better after it's sat in storage. I mean, it, it just, it really, it, it improves significantly. I mean, it just really blooms like flavor-wise after storage. Um, Pink Lady has always been really successful for us sales-wise, um, but we seem to Every year, it's one of the last apples that we harvest, and I was mentioning to people earlier, we have all this damage with spotted wing drosophila with basically fruit fly damage, and the later varieties get it way worse. Yeah, they're on the tree longer. The sugars build up, I guess. They're just a, um, to the point that probably one in three harvests, we're throwing away a huge amount of it or just juicing it. Um, as we've had a lot of trouble with that. What other ones on here? Um, yeah, Hudson's Gold Gem, we love. Hudson Golden Gem is one of what are oh, called russeted apples. They're apple. rough brown skin things, and it's 
The question is, can an apple be sugary, sweet, and tart and crisp at the same time? And the answer would be, if it's a russet, it can be. Uh, Molly's Delicious is a great apple, too. Yeah, it is. I found out about it from a fella, uh, from a managed 250-acre orchard on a kibbutz outside of Jerusalem at elevation, so our climate was somewhat similar to his. And uh, It's just a really nice, you know, sweet with a little tart acidity like that and fairly early and good size and really a clean apple really nice and just popular with folks good for fresh eating good for pies pretty good for juice but really good for fresh eating hokuto we love hokuto hokuto i love so, hokuto such too. a great apple a fuji we don't have as much of it but it's just, just crazy really robust mm -hmm. flavor oh. yeah an enterprise um definitely over spartan Enterprise um, is a great apple, dark-skinned, really dark-skinned apple. Enterprise is one of a series of apples that was put together, bred by a collaborative breeding program from the PRI people, Purdue Rutgers in Illinois, and they were originally started after the Second World, World War to develop no and low spray apples and they have some successes. And they do the cutesy thing of putting the letters P, R, and I consecutively in the name Williams Pride, uh, Enterprise, Prima, and on, Pr and Priscilla, and on and on like that. They're, they're good apples. We had, do you want to mention that one? Cause we we actually, the behind you, this, this row going down towards that power pole is actually a mix of different um, kind of uh, heirloom uh, cider apples. Oh, right. And they have great names like Hoople's Antique Gold and Yarlington Mills and Belle de Bascoop. And we actually, Belle de Bascoop is actually really delicious. It's got a very complex flavor. Yeah. And the Hoople's Antique Gold are both ones that we actually enjoy eating out of hand. Uh, some of these cider apples don't actually taste very good until They're you kind of like if you drink a little uh, paint booze. thinner or something. <laughs> but good in, in hard cider mixes, yeah. So I feel like we're getting more foggy. Maybe it's just this year and last year, but what, are, what likes to grow in kind of fog? Uh, uh, mushrooms do well. Uh, <laughs> uh, 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 the question is, what we seem to be getting more, uh, anecdotally, we seem to be getting more foggy. Uh, it varies. Uh, this year, absolutely. Last year was about the, this is the coolest summer I can remember in quite a bit. Last year was the warmest, hottest summer we can uh, had in a while, quite a while. Last, for instance, June in Santa Cruz, June gloom, fog, right? Last year, literally, we got zero degree, zero days of fog in June, somewhat similar in July. August did turn into foggus, but still. So I don't know that I could agree with. Diversify? Div there you go, always <laughs> diversify uh, like that. I mean, most of the varieties that we have. Basically, the, <laughs> we're in a cool climate. I wouldn't we didn't worry pick too that much ab about that. Uh, <clears throat> but also, you got to hunt and peck and see, talk to people in your area who grows what, what grows well. Yeah, I mean, variety wise, I was just looking at our like our list of descriptions of the apple varieties. One thing, like, but we mentioned Belle de Boscoop, um, and Hoople's Antique Gold and Hudson's Gold Gem. Those are all russeted apples, and I think they're really lovely. They're extreme. All three of them are really wonderful tasting apples, but. <laughs> so you will have the reaction from customers of like, what's wrong with this? There's something wrong with this apple. And all you because it's a take out your pocket it means it's a rough a skin. So a it's convert. like a potato. The skin is rough like a pe like some pears are. It's not yeah. a smooth, shiny skin. And many apple varieties you were rusted. There were many, many rusted apple varieties, and many of them have slowly disappeared due to customer preference for shiny red things. So... <laughs> Um, Shiny they're objects. really, really amazing apple, and I think that there's room there, you know, within that niche market of people who are wanting to taste something unusual or try something that's that's not what they're getting at a grocery store. But it does create there's there is this like <clears throat> customer barrier when they look at this apple and it's got this rough skin and what's wrong with it? I got these apples from you and there there's something wrong with all of them. Can I have a refund from like our CSA members? We'll get that sometimes. <laughs> Uh, like I said, taste testing is going to help, or just kind of that consumer info uh, like that. Um, well, like I said, in direct farm stands, we just slice an apple and say, you like it? And then people may or may not like it, but that's 
you know, individual preference, but but they're just roasted are just outstanding apples like that. So. Yeah, and as much as we talked, uh, I, I know that Oren gave a, a good, eloquent response to our um, bemoaning diversity. I personally <laughs> am in love with the fact that we have so many <laughs> apples, and during apple season, this year is not going to be as good as last year, unfortunately, but I, I eat too many apples starting in the end of July all the way through uh, the beginning of December, and I love the fact that I get to try different ones yeah. all the time. Um, yeah. Um, what about your pear varieties? And did you do any quince, rootstock, or other stuff for the heavy soils? And also, do you have any other trees besides the apple tree here? Why, why not? Uh, we don't really have other, we, we kind of stuck with the poem fruits because of our climate. We thought it was too big of a risk to try citrus and, um, stone fruit. Um, well, we did try. The, <laughs> we did try some citrus, um, yeah, and maybe there are like maybe there's one variety of plum we really should be trying, but um, yeah, we kind of stuck with things that we thought would do well in this climate. Um, pear varieties, we've got most of the well-known ones: uh, Bartlett, Bosque, uh, Danju, Camise, Red Danju. Um, and then a couple less known, Ubaline. Which is about this big. Seckle. <laughs> um, and Warren. Yeah, so that pears, that we have, <laughs> pears are a, such a larger learning curve. Um, we, uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, longer till they mature, longer till you have harvest, then a lot more difficult to determine when to harvest. So, you know, unlike an apple, you can kind of taste it and be like, oh, this tastes good. I'm going to pick it now. But with a pear, you need most of them, even the apples, even like, even the apples that are summer pears, which will ripen after being picked from the tree without chill, without chill. Most pears are better if they're put in a refrigerator and chilled for a certain amount of time. And some of them, like the Danju, I feel like it's like six to 10 or eight to 10 weeks yeah, or something yeah. like that, so you, that you, they need to be in a cooler. So yeah. you don't want to invest in pears unless you have a lot of cooler space. Um, and it, there's a learning curve and we still are not there. Me too. <laughs> in terms of figuring out when to harvest, we've harvested too late. We've harvested too early. If you harvest too early, they don't have any flavor. If you harvest too late, they get core rot and they rot from the inside out. They basically ripen from the inside out. Most bears, they're not going to ripen on the tree. You have to pick them first. Right. Um, and we've had probably the, we've had a lot of issues with rust. Disease is way more of an issue because it, even though the apples get disease, it doesn't affect the fruit as much. <laughs> we haven't had issues that it affect, uh, you know, we've still been able to harvest apples even if leaf is affected by disease but um we have horrible problems with pear scab pear slugs that cause aesthetic damage um the seckle pears are really really delicious and they do basically ripen like you can pick them and just send them to people right away and they'll ripen on your counter and we've had less issues with core rot they're tiny little things um but we've had a lot of problems with rust with those um, so in general, they've only gone to our CSA, uh, where we can educate the customer ahead of time and, you know, explain, like discount it and explain why it doesn't look good, but that it tastes great. Um, the, there's, I mean, they, they do, they, they're so delicious. Yeah. They just never the look good. The nickname for the Sackle is Sugar Lump, and it is. Um, so. The, the wa Warren and Ubaline are, are resistant to rust yeah. and we th the fruit is beautiful despite our tendency towards foggy climate and therefore all sorts of yeah, diseases. Yeah, they're both great. The trouble with the rust is some years it sets a heavy crop, some years not any. And uh, a lot of people will grow it. I know a uh, live river farm, they buy in pollen and spray it on and then they get a heavy set every year. Uh, and you can access little cheap sprayers and pollen online. but. Um, it's kind of one of the more lumpy, ugly pears there is. It's kind of one of the most divine pears there is. Which one are you speaking? Are you speaking well, of? Well, both. But the, in this case, Ob I'm talking ob ob about the um, Warren here. Uh, Obeline is just flat out big. <laughs> they're beaut. They're delicious pears, but yeah. we. It, it is so hard to nail it picking them. Yeah. Um, yeah. They don't. People are familiar, customers are very familiar with squeezing the pear to figure out if it's ripe. So they'll push their finger and you're like, oh, it's soft. Now I'm going to eat it. And they don't get soft 
even when they ripen, you just have to time, like you pull them out of the refrigerator and you have three to five days. And if you wait six days and you cut it, it's going to be, there's going to be core rot mm. and they don't get soft on the outside. So there's, it's kind of difficult to treat. So we'll get a lot of like, we'll, we'll pick it. Ideally, we send it to the customer. They said, I waited a week and it's still not ripe. And I'm like, ooh, you should have eaten it two days ago. <laughs> and then they cut it. And they're like, it's rotten. Give me my money back. <laughs> so this, this is why apples have a much higher volume but it's such of a delicious pear. pears. It's, it's difficult such a delicious even for pear. professionals to nail it. Yeah. And then... Um, Though BP Moratini, we have only one tree of BP Moratini, um, but it's a delicious pear. It it's, I, it's it'll ripen um, without much. You know, it's a summer pear, so it'll yeah. ripen without the whole. You know, six to ten weeks of chill. Tastes good. Seems to be more resistant to rust. We only have one tree though, so the BP stands for Butera Precoce in Italian. Really sweet butter pear like that. Early too. Ours are already off the tree. I'm thinking. Oh, questions and then lunch. <laughs> go, go. Um, I'm just curious about your storage for your apples and like what your cooler is. If it's in cooler, like the locks are better. Yeah, we have one um, cooler. Can you repeat the question, John? Uh, the question was what do we do about cold storage for our fruit? And uh, we do, over the years, we've had to get more coolers. Um, <laughs> and we're still learning. But we've discovered uh, that we really need to dedicate one uh, one cooler to our fruit during fruit season, and even then, it's a little challenging because the pears will be influenced by the app the 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 um, gas that's being um, outgassed by the. Yeah, commercially now they only actually put one variety of anything in one cooler because of the ethylene and the outgassing. And yeah. You really so, never want to put flowers and fruit in the same cooler. Yeah, so part of the issue, so your your pears are off-gassing. You pick them when they're ripe. There's a huge amount of ethylene. So if you put your pears in, or your, sorry, your apples, you put your apples in the cooler, um, that will, you can hold them quite a long time, but they're producing a huge amount of ethylene. Pears, when you pick them and you cold storage them in order so that they'll ripen later, you don't want a lot of ethylene. So we have this problem that if we put a pallet of pears next to a pallet of ripe apples, it'll cause them to prematurely ripen and, and cause core rot. So currently we'll harvest a pallet. We put a plastic bag over the pears to try to protect them from the ethylene from the apples and it really isn't ideal we'll put the pears on one end the apples on the other end but as the season goes on there's really not much space i mean we fill our cooler is uh that cooler is is it why it's 12 we just try i think it's 12 by 25 feet and it gets to be very challenging <laughs> maneuvering things in there as we get towards the end of the season and we've put a lot of stuff in there and we've got you know all the Danjus sitting there and the boss sitting there and they have to sit for so many weeks before we can sell them um so what temperature as close to i think it's set at like 34 um cold and we have had major losses uh during 2020 uh, there were so many power out so we we had to evacuate right and the power was cut off during the fires and we had harvested all these apples oh, and we were planning on slowly metering them out to our CSA and, you know, our entire year's crop of many, uh, you know, whole entire cooler full that we had to cut the, the um, electricity off. There was no electricity for. We ran generators every once in a while to try to cool it down. Um, so it becomes, it's like, oh, great, I could harvest this stuff and store it and then slowly sell it over time. But it also puts you in this, your entire year's harvest this precarious position. So we finally, it took a, a number of years, but we finally have backup, a large backup generator that will run all the coolers for the pack out. Um, it's really critical to your sanity. Um, if you're gonna Which invest in orchards is having proper cold storage, having adequate cold storage, whatever you think you need, you're gonna need more. So go bigger to begin with, um, rather than trying to economize and have a small space and then finding that you need to build another cooler or get, you know, um, and not have enough space for it. Um, and having, having a generator that can run everything so that you, yeah, it, it just yeah. so much Back peace of mind. Yeah. So you had a question too? Uh, yeah. Do you have any specific recommendations for taking care of trees that maybe haven't had a lot of care in maybe a couple of years or? Uh, come to our winter tree care pruning class at the UCSC farm. 
it's a methodology and a tree doesn't get kind of out of control in one year and it's a process to bring it back and you can only take a limited amount of wood off the tree annually but we usually cover that. So.